Hello, welcome back to the channel. Um, right before I start, I would like to give a shout out to Chica the Chicken. Chica the Chicken is the one who suggested this creepy pasta. And yeah, Chica the Chicken is also an artist and does a lot of art based on Five Nights at Freddy and a bunch of other cool stuff as well. So definitely check out Chica the Chicken on Instagram. There will be a link in the description below so you could uh, check it out. And again, thank you Chica the Chicken for the suggestion. I appreciate it a lot. So without any further ado, let's get right into the video. The day Jeffrey Woods and his family arrived at their new home, the sky was overcast and the weather was muggy. The gray sky seemed to punctuate his mood. Jeff was not thrilled to be here. Their new home was beautiful though, a true example of their father's newfound success. But still, it wasn't the home he knew. A week after they settled in, Jeff and Louis woke up early. The sky was crisp and gorgeous blue. And although the Louisiana heat was playing its usual cruel tricks, the brothers decided that a morning bike ride to explore the area would be just the right ticket to combat the slight pangs of homesickness that they'd both been experiencing over the last week. I miss home, Louis blurted out, and Jeff was smearing salad, salsa on the microwave burrito that would serve as his breakfast. Me too, Louis, but I guess this is home now, so we just gotta sort of uh, make the most out of it. I know, but all our friends and stuff are back in New Orleans. Remember the building we always sneak up to on top and Watch the city lights come on. I miss that, Lou responded, sounding down. Yeah, and ZM Video, the owner knew us and would always let us rent rated R movies without our parents. And he always hooked us up with free video game rentals if we got a few movies. Yeah, I miss that too. But Louis, we have to. Louis interrupted. I know, we have to make the most out of this, but still, this place just seems so fake. And mom and dad still treat us like we, are, we aren't we are even here. Yeah, they do. I was sort of hoping the new house would improve their mood, but what can we do? Louis had no answer. Jeff finished his breakfast, and the two boys left the house to mount their bikes and explore around a bit more. As it turned out, the subdivision they moved into was rather close to a cluster of stores in a small shopping center. Village Shopping Center was the name of the short row of businesses. Within these were a pizza hut, a Chinese restaurant, a tobacco store, a sprint store, and what Jeff and Lou were most excited about, a video store. We'll have to get mom and dad to come down here and open up an account so we can rent movies. Lou mentioned it as Jeff flipped a box over to read the description of a movie. Horror movie, actually. Shit. You're right. Jeff snapped. Feeling a bit frustrated, a bit of frustration at the thought. He knew getting his parents to actually come down here and set up a, ma a membership would take forever since her usual after work routine was to go off into separate rooms until they got hungry enough to come out and speak. Jeff glanced over at the girl working behind the counter. Maybe I could go over there and sweet talk her into giving us accounts, he joked. Yeah right Jeff, one look at you and she'll probably ban us, Louis remarked back with a smile on his face. You doubt me little man? Doubt you. The guy who kisses two girls and almost touched a boob? Never. Please go on over and lay all the charm. Whatever. I totally could have banged that girl. But her parents came home and... Last time you told me the story, you said her parents were out of town and her sister came home. Jeff became flustered. And while in the process of trying to make yet another comeback, the girl behind the register removed all doubt by speaking to the boys herself. Hey, aren't those your bikes? The young woman asked, pointing towards the glass window. Jeff and Louis looked over and saw three boys outside. 
two of which were riding around in circles on the Woods brothers' bikes. They would spin them around and then jump off, letting the bikes crash onto the pavement, just to stand them up and ride them again. The two boys riding the bikes were both slim and built, while a heavier boy stood on the sidewalk, drinking a Red Bull and watching. Jeff and his brother made their way towards the door of the video store when the fat kid saw them coming. Jeff couldn't hear what he said to his two friends, but he made some sort of gesture while shouting and the other two boys dumped their bikes where they laid and walked towards the sidewalk, directly towards the two brothers. These your bikes? One of the boys asked Jeff and Louis and entered the summer heat. Yeah? Why are you riding them? Louis asked sharply. We just want we just saw them there man relax figured somebody just left them there out for us the same boy responded as his two friends joined the him either side jeff determined to make a good start here shane tried to change the course of the confrontation well they're ours we just moved here about a week ago we live over on fairmount avenue a few blocks from here we were just uh, checking out the neighborhood. Jeff hoped, hoped that a civil tone could turn things around, but he could tell that the insolent look on the boy's face that this was a different gamble. Good for you. You move somewhere else, the fat kid remarked. Oh yeah, Troy, the first boy spoke. They moved into the piece of shit house with the gravel jewelry way. I was wondering who would move into that place. Well, Randy, now we know. The big kid, I, the big kid, apparently named it Troy, I replied. Jeff, trying to salvage the conversation, tried peaceful, peaceful banter one more time. Okay, so you're Troy and you're Randy. Well, I'm Jeff, and this is my brother Louis. We just moved here from New Orleans. You ain't in New Orleans now, the third boy, who just now decided to speak, remarked. Yeah, and who the fuck said you could call us by our names? Randy asked. The insolent, privileged smile never leaves his face. Jeff smiled and res responded to Randy. Well, I guess I could have called you a fucking asshole. But I figured I would give the benefit of the doubt. In that moment, a flare of rage replaced the smirk that had rested on Randy's face throughout the entire exchange. The other two boys, Troy and the still unknown third member of his band seemed to be momentarily struck silent. Perhaps they weren't used to being stood up to. Oh, I'm sorry. Was the language too adult for you? Jeff asked. And you, quiet boy. We, we know this is in New Orleans. Jeff stated to the slim kid that had remained, reminded him of the geo geographical locations. Because if this was New Orleans, you three would already have gotten your ass kicked for touching somebody else's shit. The slim kid looked back and forth at his two friends. However, Randy, clearly the leader, seemed to know what to say. Kenneth, you're gonna let him talk you gonna let this little bitch talk to you like that? Jeff knew this part, and while he wanted quite badly to sock Randy and his pals around, a real concern suddenly invaded his mind. If he and Louis got into a fight on their first week in this new neighborhood, his parents would freak. He could practically hear it now. And while things had been far from perfect in their home, even after the move, there was a peace that had fallen over the family. And Jeff, fighting his uh, urges, decided to, to, do the, to do his best to keep it. Jeff looked over the three. Well, very well dressed, very privileged looking suburban kids before them and dismissed them. You guys are boring. Come on, Louis. Let them continue their play dates without us. Louis laughed at that and followed behind his brother towards the bikes. However, Randy and his little gang of would be thugs would have none of that. They moved to block Jeff and his brother once again. Where are you going, pussies? Randy asked, shoving Jeff. 
Jeff could tell that the shove had no real conviction. Randy was trying to figure him out, seeing where his buttons were. He pushed harder eventually, but Jeff swallowed the slowly building anger within him once more. Lou took a bit more exception to the shove. We're going to your mom's house. Me and my brother saved up a couple dollars from doing chores and we heard she doesn't charge much. As the words left Louis's mouth, Randy appeared to only register a small portion of it all. Randy Hedron had grown up in Medenville. His father was a partner at a local firm that made a lot of money, something else that Jeff would soon come to learn. Randy and his friends, well the same age as Jeff, had grown up in very different circumstances. They were used to being listened to. They were, loose, they were used to being feared. In fact, Randy, the target of the insult, just stood there. It was actually Troy, the fat kid who'd stepped forward, fist balled, balled, eyes squinting in anger. Who are you talking to? Troy said. Troy shouted, actually, and took a wild swing at Louis. Louis, who was both in better shape and had sp sparred with Jeff a time or two during uh, his time spent boxing, was able to avoid the punch, but just barely. Had that been all, it may, had, it may have once again ended there. Troy was clearly taken by surprise at Louis' speed, and actually didn't attempt another punch. However, these were bullies. Kids that ran in a pack for a reason. The skinny one, Kenneth, stepped around and threw a punch that connected with the left side of Louis' face. Jeff had seen enough. He'd been shocked at how quickly this evolved into blows, even though he expected it from the start. When he'd first met Randy and his friends, he'd been curious. From there, he developed an annoyance with them. And slowly that annoyance had evolved into anger. However, upon seeing Louis punched, seeing the small trickle of blood from his brother's lower lip, upon seeing the smug look of satisfaction in Kenneth's face, the anger that Jeff felt suddenly exploded into a rage that he had never felt before in his life. Jeff Woods did not hesitate. He stepped forward, his foot automatically falling into the correct stance that he learned from boxing classes his father once enrolled him into and delivered a powerful right hand to Kenneth's face. The skinny boy had no time to regi register shock or pain. The punch caught him by surprise and his knees buckled. Kenneth went down to the ground in a heap of confusion and drawing fear. Randy the so-called leader here was almost too shocked to move. He'd had quite a lot of experience starting fights, but no real time logging, logged into losing them. He'd never felt control of a situation slip. He was used to being in charge, so now seeing one of his friends go down so quickly and easily left him in a state of shock that he had no idea how to address. Troy, on the other hand, seemed to have a plan, drawing another punch. He moved towards Jeff deceptively faster than his weight would seem to allow, and threw two equally fast punches. Jeff, however, had no problem sidestepping both attempts. Troy, seeing loss for action, actually dropped his arms as if saying, gee, what do I do now? Jeff had the answer. He moved in, drew three hooks in Joy's stomach. The hefty kid's eyes went as wide as pie pans. A fitting analogy, Jeff thought. He staggered it back, clutched his throbbing stomach. Jeff wasted no time and stepped it in once more, fetching a sharp punch to the big kid's jaw, causing Troy to promptly fall on his ass. Jeff was reminded of King Hippo from the punch out games he used to play. He couldn't help but smile. Jeff now turned his focus on Randy. He advanced on the boy, feeling something new forming inside of him. 
He still felt the anger, the rage, actually, and the antics of these three assholes. They had the nerve to mess with their bikes, the nerve to insult two kids they never met before, and of course, the ultimate offense, touching his brother. However, mix it in with this rage was also a sweet, enjoyable pleasure. Not only was he kicking their ass, but he was loving every second of it. It was as though the joy of showing them, showing them up was perfectly blending with the rage he felt towards them. Together, it formed into a sadistic, controlled sense of power. That was until Louis stepped in front of him. Jeff, stop. That's enough. Why stop now, Lou? They wanted this. Jeff replied in a flat voice that Louis had never heard come from his brother's mouth. She's calling the cops. Look. Louis shouted again, and this time Jeff came back to reality long enough to listen. He glanced over at the video store clerk and saw her on the phone, talking frantically and pointing towards the parking lot. Suddenly, Jeff, strange sadistic haze, collapsed, and he regained his former self. Fuck, let's go, he steadied quickly. And he and Louis mounted their bikes and rode towards the parking lot exit. Yeah, you better fucking run, Randy called behind them. Louis, Jeff and Louis paid no mind and pedaled it away. A few blocks down the street, they dismounted their bikes and began to walk, to get, walk them together. At first, neither, neither of them both spoke. Then Louis broke the silence. Jeff, thanks for standing up for me back there. Thank you. Yeah, those guys were pieces of shit. They had it coming, Jeff replied, looking down at the street as they walked. What? What happened? I never seen you seen you like that before. Just defending myself, Louis. What was I supposed to do? Let them beat you up? I bet they go to our school. I bet we'll see them there. And we won't forget this. And they won't forget this. Who cares? We didn't ask to move here. We didn't ask for any of this. Mom and, Je Mom and Dad just... They just want a bigger house and a nicer neighborhood. And we were all along for the ride whenever we liked it or not. Think I give a shit where these rich asshole kids think of us? Jeff stated. We went back to look at his feet. Think we'll get in trouble? Louis asked. For what? Defending ourselves? Yeah, I guess you're right. They did start it, Louis answered. And the two brother and the two brothers, the matter was close. However, things were far from over. They found that the trouble they'd believed they had escaped was in fact waiting for them at their front door. Jeff and Louis saw the police cars well before they arrived at their driveway. Two cops' cars, both parked in front of their house. Both of them felt their stomachs drop as they well knew why the police were there. The brothers entered the living room to see their parents sitting on the couch, two cops standing up, leaning against the wall, writing in their notebooks. What did you two do? Sheila practically screeched at the two boys entering the house. Louis, younger and less centered than Jeff, began to fall on the defensive. Some kids tried to jump us down by the video store. They were messing with our bikes, and when we went outside, they got in our faces. That's not, that's not the way we heard it. Matt Woods interjected, the father. His voice, firm and ripe, with anger and dissatisfaction. No, Dad, that's what happened, Jeff began to explain. We were down at the friendly video looking around the store and these three kids started riding around on our bikes. All we did was walk outside and the kids started talking trash to us, trying to bug us to fight. When we tried to leave, one of them punched Louis. Finally, one of the two cops spoke. His name tag said Williamson. Boys, we have some serious complaints about the two of you. From the eyewitnesses at the shopping center say, two of you started the confrontation with Randy and his friends. Jeff took notice at how familiar the cop's tone was when he said Randy's name. 
this was a small town after all and there was a good chance that the cop coached Randy in Little League or drank beers with his dad. Hell, it's even possible that the cop could even be an uncle to one of the bullies. No sir, Jeff replied. We didn't start it, they did. We just wanted our bikes back. We just wanted to leave, but they blocked us. Williamson continued, as though he heard nothing Jeff said. Several witnesses including the video store clerks say that you swung first. They say that the boys were riding your bikes, but let me ask you this. Did you chain your bike to anything, or did you just leave them outside the store? What does that matter? Louis demanded. Well, son, if you just leave your bikes lying around in the street, you can't exactly blame Randy and his friends for riding them, now can you? It will be different if you had secured them somehow, but you just left them there. Mom, Dad, you're not buying this crap, are you? You know me and Louis don't start fights. When have we ever? These street punks mess with us, and if you can't tell that these cops are taking their side, then you need to open your eyes. Jeff knew he was skating on thin ice, but that rage, it demanded some sort of satisfaction. Jeffrey, do not speak to, do not speak about the officers in that tone of voice, and do not speak to us that way either. Now it's pretty obvious that you two aren't happy here, that you miss your old home, but starting fights in the street isn't going to change anything. Jeff mother snapped it back. Listen boys, you're lucky none of the parents want to press charges. This will be reported as a simple scuffle between teenagers, but be advised, you both, you both won't notice. This is a quiet town, not like New Orleans. We don't tolerate that sort of behavior over here. If you see Randy, Ken, or Troy, I highly suggest you tell them you're sorry. We will be keeping an eye on both of you, so don't let this happen again. You don't want to have an arrest record, now do you? Jeff felt his anger bubbling up and he couldn't hold his tongue. Who is he to you, officer? Wilson? Is Randy your nephew? Is he a friend, son? Or maybe you go over and screw his mom while you're on duty. Which one is it, officer? That's it. Both of you go to your rooms. Matt Woods apparently found that he wasn't a mute after all, and he ordered his son out of the room. Jeffrey and Lou walked up the stairs. However, they refused to hang their heads in shame or felt any, or feel any guilt. Neither of the parents spoke to them for the rest of the day. Jeff and Lou stayed upstairs, visiting their, venting their shared frustration to each other. They'd been screwed over. Even at their young age, they knew that. They took some sol solace in the fact that they were at least at least hadn't been uh, arrested or cited. But still, they saw what was really going on here. That cop, he was protecting Randy, Jeff whispered in to his younger brother. No shit, Louis replied. We'll, we have to watch ourselves. We have to take care of each other. You saw it down there. Even our parents didn't stand up for us. Yeah. Well, what the hell was up with that, Louis asked. Imagine, their fucking image. That's what's up with it. All they care about is fitting in here. They want to make sure they blend in with the rest of the step forward families. No more fighting. If we see Randy and his two fucked up friends again, we just walk away. Okay? But Jeff, you can kick the shit out of them. Why would you want to walk away? Louis asked. Because I can't kick the shit out of the cop, Louis. I can't kick the shit out of mom and dad. And that's what would get us. Fuck Randy and his pals are protected here. You know me. You and me. We're not protected. If we see them, just avoid them. Okay? Please. Louis nodded. I feel like a little bitch though. I owe Kenneth for hitting me. No, you don't. I paid him back for that. And paid his fat friend too. I hope they just leave us alone now, Jeff sighed. Jeff and Louis didn't hear from their parents for the rest of the day. They remained in their rooms late into the night and finally came down to eat after they were sure the folks had gone to bed. Louis said that he felt relieved about that, 
but Jeff had a sinking feeling that the worst had yet to come. Jeff was correct. The next morning, the two brothers came downstairs to eat breakfast. Their parents had already were already sitting up in the dining room table, staring at the boys, approving of nothing they saw. Sit down, Matt said flatly. What's going on, Louis asked. Sit down, Matt stated again. Anger danced in his words. The boys complied without f further question. Matt, Wo Wo Matt Woods began the diab tribe. Whatever that was yesterday, beating up some kids for touching your bikes, mouthing off at the police, disrespecting me and your mother, that stops today. We didn't beat anyone up for touching our bikes, Jeff blurted. Shut up, Jeff. This is a one-way conversation, his father barked. That kid, Randy Heeds then. His father is partner with a firm. Did you know that? Do you even think about that when you were assaulting him over a godforsaken bike? You just don't think, do you, Jeff? Sheila added. How could I have known that? Matt continued. While well, I've just spent the entire morning talking to his father over the phone, his dad is willing to let it go. But shit, son, I have to deal with that at work now. Do you have any idea how much damage this could have done to me? To our family? Jeff felt the rage coming back. He felt it all. He fought with all his might to keep it stiff. Instead, he once more tried to appeal to the two adults' par parental side. Mom, look at Louis' face. They split his lip. Can you see? It's still swollen. Louis turned his head to better showcase the injury. My god, Jeff. So some kid played a little rough with your brother. Is that any reason to fight them? I wanted to make friends with some of the other families in the neighborhood, but thanks to you, I just don't know. Soon, so no sooner could Jeff or his brother construct a proper defense than their father began speaking again. So your mother and I have talked this through. Since there are only a couple of weeks of summer vacation left, we decided that Louis should spend the rest of the season at Aunt Marcy's place. S Several days had passed, and the tensions be were high between Jeff and his parents. Without Louis around, there was nothing for him to do except sit in his room and play video games. He went outside, but didn't venture far from home. He knew if Randy and his goons showed up again, it would likely result in another fight. For a few days, it worked well, and Jeff believed he could get through this. However, his mother changed all that on one evening morning. Jeff was awakened suddenly by sharp sunlight striking his face. He heard his mother humming, something that she rarely did. Even in his half-sleep state, he knew that it, the humming was forced. She was doing it to wake him up and figured that adding sunlight would get things done even faster. When she noticed Jeff's eyes cracking open, she sauntered over to his bed and began speaking in a tone that simply oozed false juvility. At first, Jeff had refused. Could his mother be this serious? Did she really expect him to go over and make friends with Randy? He was still in bed when his mother stopped her incessant humming long enough to tell him to get up and get dressed. Once he learned why, he told her that no, no way in hell. However, his mother was a shrewd manipulator and she knew exactly what would get the job done. She promised Jeff that if he did this for her, went over and made things work with Randy, that Louis could come home the next day. She'd sandbagged Jeff right into the corner with that one. He had no choice but to agree. A short time later, Jeff and his mother were pulling into Randy's driveway. Randy's mother answered the door. Hi, Jeff. Hi, you must be uh, Jeff, she greeted. Jeff smiled wanly and confirmed that, in fact, that was in fact who he was. Hello, I'm Cheryl Woods. Nice to finally meet you in person, Jeff mutter answered, bragging 
past her son and extending a hand to Randy's mother. Sheila, so pleased to meet you. I am pretty get heathen. Sorry to hear that our boys had a little mishap the other day. You know how it is with teenagers, almost going crazy and all. Randy never gets into fights, but he explained to me that Jeff and his brother are still new to the area and haven't quite learned how to do things in Mattville yet. Isn't that right, Jeff? Jeff couldn't resist a small jab. Yeah, sorry about that, Miss Hedra. Me and Louie had no idea that it was okay for your sons and his friends to mess with our bikes without asking. But it get. He gets his mouth from his father. Never knows when to shut up. How about you and I go in and have some coffee and you tell me all about the great gossip about Madville while our boys get to know each other the right way. Randy's in his room, Jeff. Upstairs, second door to your left. I'm sure you'll hear the sound of his video games or something. Regret stated with a little sense of humor in her voice. Thank you, ma'am, Jeff answered and entered the house. Jeff knocked and heard Randy answer with, Come in. Hey, so I guess you heard. Our parents want us to hang out. Get to know each other, Jeff stated with, started with a little conversation. Yeah, that's my mom, alright. She doesn't like drama. Honestly, I think she worries too much. I mean, I'm cool if you're cool. Jeff sat down on the floor next to Randy and struck up the conversation. So, turns out your dad isn't my dad. It's my dad's boss, right? He freaked out about the fight in the parking lot. He was actually worried that he'd get fired or something. My dad is like everyone's boss. I fucking hate it. I think half the kids at my school talk to me because their parents are somehow connected to my dad's firm. Why do you hate it? Jeff asked. Because it's fake? The whole damn town is fake. you figure it out as you go. But trust me, everyone who lives here is just trying to pretend there's something else. My parents make me do all this shit. All the trophies and stuff. Just so they could brag about it. That's it. Jeff smiled. I know how you feel. My dad had me boxing, had me in a boxing class uh, yeah, about a year ago because some uh, co workers of his had a brother that worked at the place or some. As soon as the guy quit, though, I was dragged out of that gym the next week. I wish it was that easy, Randy responded. I hate playing baseball, but my dad will sure have me out uh, there again next summer and the summer after that. It's like he knows I hate it, but wants to make sure that I'm out there with his stupid company name on the back of my jersey. Randy, why did you and your friends fuck with our bikes the other day? I told you it's a fake town. And boring as shit. There's nothing to do here. You have to find stuff to do. I mean, there are only so many times you can go out and hang at the video store or ride the dirt paths in the woods. All the girls here are stock up. All the stores are closed early. There's no mall and no movie theaters across town. We just bored here, man. So sorry for that, I guess. It's cool, Jeff replied. I guess I'm sorry too. Thanks went too far. You mean the fight? Randy asked. That shit was actually cool. Those guys, uh, Kenneth and Troy, they just leech on because of my dad. It's like I told you, uh, I'm pretty sure their parents make them hang out with me. The afternoon went on and Jeff soon forgot that this was a mandatory arrangement. He actually started to find himself liking Randy. Sure, their first encounter was a little sketchy, but he f was coming around, to, around, coming around to the guy, finding that he wasn't so bad once his idiot friends removed, uh, were removed from the question. About an hour later, things took a new turn. Jeff heard the twins pop off two car doors shutting in a near unison. And then he heard the engine start up. He dropped the game controller and peered out through Randy's bedroom window. Just in time to see his mother and Randy's mother backing out of the driveway. My parents are leaving, Jeff said. About time. I figured my mother would eventually talk your mother into going shopping. Or going to get coffee or something like that. Jeff heard Randy's pause the game. Hey Jeff, come downstairs. I want to show you some cool stuff. Randy invited, and Jeff followed. 
Randy led Jeff to the garage. It was hot in there, but the main door shut. The garage was well kept though, and Jeff observed stacks of magazines underneath a workbench, as well as tools and various other utility items stacked about. Standing in the small, close, closed in garage, with the summer heat lingering about, Jeff began to feel a bit uneasy. Despite the fact that Randy had seemed to bond over the last few hours, Jeff couldn't ignore the sense that things were different now that the adults were gone. What did you want to show me? Jeff asked. Hold on, let me get it out. Randy replied, moving the magazines out to reveal a small red box. Jeff watched it as Randy removed the box and opened it. Check it out, my dad's flare gun, Randy announced, and waved the red tumbler gun about. Whoa, be careful with that, Jeff shouted, more out of shock than real concern. It's fine, dude, don't be such a pussy. It's not even loaded, Randy said. However, Jeff watched it as he fished one of the flares out of the back compartment. Randy then continued to fiddle with the flare gun, popping it open and loading the flare. Now it's loaded, he announced. My dad showed me how to use this last year when we when we went out boating. Sometimes it takes it sometimes I take it out and shoot a flare at the trees. But maybe this time I don't need a tree. The change in Randy's voice and demeanor was impossible to ignore. Okay, well, cool gun. Let's go back into the house though. It's hot out here, plus I'm getting hungry. What do you want to eat? However, as Jeff turned it to walk through the small door leading back into the house, the path was suddenly blocked by two more familiar faces. Where are you going, Jeffrey? The fat kid, Troy, blurted out, and he and Kenneth stepped forward into the garage. Took you two assholes long enough to get here. I've had to babysit this faggot all day, Randy shouted. And a wicked joy was present in his words. Yeah, sorry Randy, but Kenneth here had to mow his front yard before his parents would let him come over up. Joy said, a sheepish tone in to his voice. It's cool, we're here now, Kenneth said. What the fuck's going on? Jeff asked, staring at Randy. He noticed that Randy still had the flare gun in his hands. I'll tell you what's going on, Jeff. You owe Kenneth and Troy an apology for what you did. You sucker punched them and then ran away. You didn't even have the balls to fight them fair. So now, you're gonna pay for what you owe. I'm not gonna fight you, okay? I'm done with that shit, Jeff replied as he glanced about the room for an exit. You're right about that. You're not gonna fight. You're going to stand there and let my boys get their licks and then I'm gonna get mine. And when there, that's done, you get the fuck out of my house. I'll tell my mom that you got si sick and walked home. After that, if I see you again, you better walk the other way. I'm not going to stand here and get hit by your friends, so just let me go home now. How about that? I'll tell my mom that we'll cool and everything, and everybody wins. Okay? Jeff asked. Randy then raised the flare gun towards Jeff. No. You stay, pussy. You stay and take your licks. Jeff felt the sensation once more. That sick rich dark matter that swirled about inside of him. He could taste it now. It was heavenly. In his mind, he ignored himself driving into it, swimming in it, letting it swallow him whole. He looked around and, and the sensation only grew. He saw Randy standing there holding the frail gun. It was limp in his hands now, and the hammer was not clocked back. Jeff knew that Randy had no intention of firing it. He looked it over at Kenneth, skinny and pathetic, a kid born to follow. Troy, fat and sweaty, bringing a bit heavy from his walk over. And of course, in the middle of it all, Jeff's, Jeff himself. He felt the pleasure being mixed with the rage, forming the perfect product. He tried to avoid sampling it. He knew that, that only regret could come from indulging in it. However, when it was placed so close, when the aroma and the promise of that sweet savory flavor was only inches away, Jeff found that he could, only, he could no more stand against it than his ship 
in the ocean could stand against a typhoon. Biff began to smile. Why are you smiling at me? You queer or something? Randy asked, a slightly nervous thing in his tone voice. Am I smiling, Randy? I guess it's because I just have so much fun, Jeff announced, and suddenly lunged towards the unprepared kid holding the flare gun. Jeff struck Randy once in the nose. Randy's arm dropped. Arms dropped. Yet he kept holding the flare gun. Jeff, without even needing to look, realized that Troy and Kenneth had actually taken a step back instead of advancing as they should have. Jeff delivered another strong blow to Randy's jaw, causing the boy to drop the, to the floor. Jeff now turned his attention to Troy and Kenneth, the two kids that had yet to actually make such mm, so much as he moved in his direction. Troy actually backed up his step and stumbled over the stack of magazines that Randy had moved earlier. Jeff took this opportunity to step and step forward, once again introducing Troy's round belly to his fist. Troy tried to stay on his feet, but Jeff's punches, combined with the stumble over the magazines, caused Troy to fall back, landing hard and striking his head on the concrete stab that was on the garage floor. Kenneth was actually trying to back away, however, Jeff was currently standing between him and the only exit in the garage. Since the carpool door was open, Jeff took two quick steps towards the skinny kid and felt the most intense joy as seeing Kenneth stagger backwards, knocking him back into the wall. That perfect blend of pleasure, control and rage had come together. Jeff felt as though he was floating about the world. Somewhere in his mind, he knew there would be hell to pay for this. But at the exact moment in time, he could care less. He didn't care about Lou. He didn't care about him being arrested. He only cared about, he didn't care about his dad getting fired. All he cared about, in a fraction of time, was hurting Kenneth. Kenneth tried to make a run for it, hoping to squeeze through the small gap between Jeff and the door. However, Jeff clapped him a hard right hand to his face, causing Kenneth to stagger back again. Jeff could see that his knees were buckling and took advantage. He moved in, pinning Kenneth to the wall and began to deliver blow after blow to the skinny kid's stomach. Kenneth's eye began, be, became large and soothed. Once satisfied, Jeff st stepped back and watched in, de in demonic glee Kenneth slowly slid down to the wall, gasping for air. Randy got to his feet, but seeing to have no idea what to do. We done now, Randy? We good? Or do you and your friends need more? Jeff mocked. No more, we're cool. How about you, asshole? Jeff asked. It was Randy's idea, Kenneth said weakly. Yeah, man, but we don't even want to, uh, Troy agreed. The debate may have continued, but the sound of a returning car broke the tension. Oh shit, my mom's back. Randy shouted. His voice cracked in a humorous way. It seemed that the previous tough guy had all but shrunk back to a scared child. So we'll just say that we're all just hanging out, Kenneth replied. No, the fucking flare gun. If she finds out I messed with it, I'm screwed. So put it back, Jeff suggested. The sensation of rage was fading again and he felt controlled and returning. Yeah, grab the magazines, please. Randy begged. Jeff found that he rather liked that tone. The begging, wimping dog mentality. Jeff was paying no attention to Randy. He was down on the floor calmly gathering the magazines. He didn't really care if Randy got in trouble or not. However, if his mother returned it and found trouble, he feared that Lou may not be able to return home as promised. Everything else happened in a flash, both literally and figuratively. Randy, now in a panic over the trouble he'd be in if he was caught playing with the flare gun, had begun to sweat. As his hands frantically clawed over the gun, his thumb pushed the hammer back, unintentionally. He didn't even notice that the gun was clocked. He was turning it over in his hands, trying to quickly disarm it. 
He then heard the sound of keys in the front door. He knew he only had seconds to hide it. Everything else happened in slow motion. The gun slipped from Randy's sweaty hands as he'd attempt to rotate it once more. He saw it fall onto the floor, seemed to float to the ground rather than fall. Jeff, busy staking the stacking the magazines, had only enough time to register Randy's shock gasp. He turned to look at the boys in the boys' direction, just in time to see the light red flare of the gun hit the floor. The gun discharged, launching a spinning ball of fire directly into Jeff's face. Jeff felt the hot flash of heat and pain tear across the left side of his face. After the initial registry of agony, there was no more thinking. Jeff began to scream, clutching to the left side of his face and rolling around on the floor. For a while, he forgot everything as he was plunged into the dark. Rich syrup once more, and rage again, almost a rage almost severing to dull the pain. When he finally did come to a stable level of alertness, he realized he was in a hospital room. Half of his face was bandaged. He knew that much. He wanted to open his eyes and speak, let it let his family know he was awake, but the drug still had a hold on him. He was awake, but not quite yet functional. He could hear several familiar voices though. Is he going to be alright doctor? Jeff's mother asked. Oh yes ma'am, your son will be fine, however he will have a lengthy road to recovery and will need your support. The flare struck his face causing a third degree burn on his left side. How bad is the eye? Jeff's father asked. Hard to say at this point. He will need to see an optometrist for further review, but the damage appears quite severe. And his face? What about his face? Jeff's mother asked, sounding deeply concerned. Well, we are able to clean and treat the injury in time, so no concern for infection or anything in that matter. We'll want him on antibiotics for a while, and he'll need to have the wounds clean it and dress it on a regular basis. But all in all, the son got very lucky. The damage could have been much more severe. Doctor, his mother began again. What if the what if this is permanent damage? What do we do about that? As I said, the optometrist will have to examine the eye. Sheila Woods interrupted the doctor, sounding more agitated than before. You're not listening. Not the eye, his face. What do we what do we do to correct his face? She demanded. Well ma'am, uh, we'll have to treat his face. Like I said, there should be a risk of infection. There shouldn't be a risk of infection. So long as you, she cut him off again. Not the infection, his appearance. What do we do about that? Miss Woods, that's hardly a concern at this point. Once he is healed and back to his feet, you can possibly explore plastic surgery to repair some of the damages. But honestly, right now, we can't waste concerns on his looks. What is important is that your son is healthy. He can expect to be back home in a few days, maybe sooner. Jeff Dad spoke again. Okay, thank you, doctor. Can we have some time alone, please? Wife and I need to speak. Certainly, the doctor replied. Lou, why don't you go to the hospital cafe and get yourself a snack? Matt Wood suggested. But I want to be here in case Jeff wakes up, Louis replied. Louis, they told us that Jeff is heavily medicated. They don't expect him to wake up any time tonight. So just go, and if he does come around, we'll have you paged. Matt replied. Jeff heard the door open and close as Louis exited. His parents both let out a long, shanky sigh, but Jeff was starting to believe it was not a sigh of relief, but rather one of stress. We're going to have to homeschool him now, Matt. That's just what it's going to be. We're going to have to keep him at home. He heard his mother rant. Her voice sounded frantic. What? I mean, he will probably won't be able to start school right on time, but I doubt he'll miss a whole year, his father responded, trying to maintain a calmer voice. I'm not talking about that, Matt. I'm not worried about him missing a week or two of school. I meant, I mean his face, Matt. You heard what the doctor said. His face is going to be disfigured. Sheila argued back. You don't even know the full extent of the damage yet, Sheila. It could be minor. It could possibly heal. 
and you heard what he said. Plastic surgery could be an option in time. In time? What kind of time? A year? Two years? And what about the in the meantime? People are going to see him and they're going to talk. Is that what you want? It's going to be a... A paria. Uh, you think anyone is going to want to have him around the kids? Their kids? Jeff was hearing all of this. Just letting it soak in. Slowly. And his mind absorbed the words. He felt that rage returning. Sick. Rich. Dark. That syrup of raw primal energy. He wanted to scream at his mother. To tell her to shut up. That he was the one lying here. Half his face burned. Blind in one eye. All thanks to his her forcing him to go over to Randy's house. He wanted to ask her why she left. Why she went off to go shopping with her. Or have her nails done or whatever it was that she did. He wanted to know why she leave him alone with the kid who just days before tried to jump him and his brother. He wanted to know how she could care more about his appearance than the fact that he was lying in the hospital. However, there was still so much more that he wanted to know as well. He wanted to know how much more of his mother, his mother hated him. How much more he, she saw him now as a, how did she put it, a pariha. He wanted to continue to swirl, swim in the thick pool of dark hatred that was starting to form from the rage and anger. He wa that was a new one. Before it was anger, then it was anger mixed with pleasure, but now it was anger mixed with, mixed with hatred. And while he clearly longed to be free of it, while he most certainly preferred the false sense of love and concern he believed he had heard from her before, he also wanted to test it out a bit more. He also began to wonder, how well would this new recipe blend with pleasure? How would it feel? Mad Woods began to speak again. I just don't believe he shot himself in the face with a flare gun. I always thought Jeff was more responsible than that. Don't even get me started, Sheila replied. I, c I couldn't believe it when Randy and his friends explained to the medics and the police how it all happened. Randy was trying to show Jeff around the house and wanted to show him the collection of magazines his dad kept in the gar garage. You know boys, he probably hoped that a couple of playboys would be in there or something. Then he said Jeff found the box containing the flare gun and just wouldn't stop playing around with it. You should have heard the, those border boys, Matt. They told me that they practically be begged Jeff to put it down before he got hurt, but he just had to show off. I just don't know where we went wrong, Matt. I thought we moved out here to a nice quiet neighborhood it would make everyone happy. Jeff, though, He's just, he just wants to fight us on everything. And while all this came together in Jeff's mind, he continued to swim in that black ichor of hate and air rage. The morphine drip it uh, added a nice touch of euphoria. Jeff could almost see himself plunging into syrup waters of hate and emerging changed. Each drip brought him so much twisted pleasure, and that was when he finally understood it. He could sample the pleasure now, not because he was enjoying what was happening, but because he knew he could enjoy what was to come. Just as the doctor had predicted, Jeff was scheduled to go home a few days later. During his time at the hospital, he never asked to see his face. It wasn't until the last day that he finally asked for a mirror. The nurse had come in to change his bandages as was the routine. She was a pleasant woman. She spoke to him, asked him how he was doing. He enjoyed her visits. So on the final day when she arrived to clean and dress his face, he asked to see himself. Are you sure, sweetheart? Would you like me to call your parents first? She asked. No, thank you, Jeff replied. I think I want to see it for myself first, without them standing over me. I understand, she replied honestly, without a hint of retention. Once the bandages were off, she handed him a small handed mirror. Would you like me to step out of the room? She asked. Jeff ignored her and looked at himself. Taking stock of the damage, 
Sure enough, his face was a mess. The entire left side, at least. The flare struck him, traveling upwards, and burned a scar into his left cheek that extended to his eye. At first glance, it almost looked like he was smiling on that side. The scar was still bright red, and burned tissue spread it out of either side. Once it arrived at his eye, the news did not get any better. His eye was white, just a lifeless bulb plugged it into his face. He closed his right eye and found that he could see nothing from his left eye at all. The scars continued up the left side of his forehead. The damage was less severe though. There however, it, the, the hair on the left side of his head was burned off, leaving a few strands to stick up here and there. Sorry sweetie, but I have to put clean bandages on, she told him. Jeff smiled it. It's okay, there will be plenty of time for me to admire myself later. There was no joy from his parents on the ride home or upon arrival. They spoke very little and there was no there was a tension in the car that simply wouldn't fade out. As for Louis, he was thrilled that his brother was okay, but he didn't know what to say concerning the damage to his face. So after uh, asking a few questions about the accident and the recovery, he fell silent as well. They walked into their home at dusk and Louis asked about dinner. He suggested they let Jeff pick a place to celebrate his home, return home. Just go to sleep, both of you. Go to sleep, Sheila remarked. She and her husband both retreated to their bedrooms as well to argue or feel sorry for themselves. Who knew? Jeff and Louis didn't speak much that night. Jeff spent most of the evening staring at himself in the mirror. He just pulled back the bandages and looked at the scars. Louis wanted to see them too, but he felt that it might be imprudent to ask. I'm glad you're home, Jeff. I really missed you and I'm glad you're okay. Louis said to Jeff as he stared at himself. I'm not okay, Louis, and neither are you. None of us really. There is just a sickness here. The only difference is now my sickness shows on the outside as well. Jeff replied, his voice a flat as that of an answering machine. What are you talking about? Louis asked. One day, you'll see it too. This is what happens though. This is what happens when it all falls down, Jeff said, just peeking through the bandages. Jeff, I don't know what you're trying to say. Louis responded. Jeff didn't reply though. After several moments, Louis left him alone. Louis went down to his parents' bedroom and knocked on the other door. What is it? The voice of his mother asked. Mom, I think Jeff is acting weird. You may want to come talk to him. Go away, Louis. Leave your mother alone. His father's voice answered. Louis, being young, had no other ideas, so he returned to his own bedroom. He didn't know that those would be the last words he'd ever hear his parents speak to him. That night, Sheila and Matt Woods awoke together. Both being light sleepers, it took litter to bring them out of slumber. The sudden removal of their blankets as it was snatched from their bed did the trick just fine. They awoke to a small light coming from, half bath, from the half bath that was situated in their master bedroom. The door was cracked open only slightly, and the light source was weak. They could make out a human shape standing over the bed though. What? What's going on? Sheila grumbled. As their vision came into focus, they realized that their son was standing before them. Matt reached over and flipped on the lamp next to their bed. Jeff was standing there, his bandages off, his face, dis his disfigured face gleaming down at them with a long kitchen knife clutched in his right hand. What are you doing, son? Matt asked, his mind still trying to shake out the cobwebs of sleep. He's got a knife! Shula screamed, grabbing hus at her husband's arm. Matt kept, Matt kept compulsion, though. Sheila, it's probably the painkillers. He's likely got up and got disoriented. 
Relax for Christ's sakes. Jeff tilted his head to one side, still not speaking. He stared hard at his father, slowly bringing the knife up, ensuring that he saw it as well. Son, what, what are you doing? Matt asked. Scaring you? Jeff replied with no emotion in his voice. Matt, do something, Sheila pleaded. Okay, son, I realize you've been through a lot, but you need to go back to bed. I'm going to call the doctor in the morning and Jeff quickly moved across to his father's side of the bed, his head moving about, alternating between normal looking young man and the deformed ghoul that had been lurking in the shadows. Okay, son, you scared me. Is that what you wanted? Matt asked, adjusting the middle of the bed to the distance between himself and his son. Good. Now I can start hurting you. Jeff spoke again with no emotion. His father had time to utter a single syllable, most likely to ask another question, to try and reason with his son. Jeff, however, gave him time to do no more than that. He lunged it onto the bed, driving the knife into his father's stomach. Matt attempted to fend Jeff off, but the wound to the med section rendered him into shock, and his arms fell to the sides. Jeff could hear his mother screaming, but paid no mind. He wanted to finish his father off first. Removing the knife, Jeff stabbed down into the stomach three more times, quickly. His father gasped and coughed for blood. His body jerked and twitched each time the knife found its mark. After the third time, Matt Woods lied still. Sheila had backed up against the headboard of the bed. She wanted to climb down, make a run for it, but she balled herself up between the headboard and the, and the end table. In a frantic state of terror and confusion, she couldn't figure out how to do something as simple as dismount a bed. Jeff, what, what, why are you doing this to us? She asked feebly. Randy started it. You must have known that. But you ignored it. Louise had a busted up lip. You must have seen that, but you ignored it. I was shot in the face with a flare gun, but you believe Randy. Why? So you could fit in? Jeff asked in a low, almost growling voice. No baby, I, I believe you. It was just your father's job. And we're new here and... Oh God, please Jeff. His mother begged. Tell me about homeschooling, Mom. Tell me about homeschooling. Tell me about how you don't want to send me out into public because of my face. Tell me how none of the other kids were meant to be my friends. And how none of their parents will want to be your friend. Tell me about that, Mom. Tell me how nice it's going to be homeschooling me. Jeff, please. I was just stressed. I was worried about you, that's all. Please, I, I love you. Mom, I think you should take your own advice. You know, what you told Louis when we got home tonight. You wanted to do something nice to welcome me home. And do you remember what you told us instead? Do you remember what you told us to do instead? Jeff asked. As he now called it over cornering his mother on the bed. What did I say? She asked, the question coming out barely as a whisper. Go to sleep, Jeff snared, and drove the knife into his mother's chest. He stabbed her over and over again, and as he did, he finally found that perfect recipe. The heavily blend, the rage, that rage, that hate, that pleasure, all mixed into a perfect formula. And for a while, Jeff he became lost in it all. Jeff opened his brother's bedroom door, not surprised to find his brother asleep. He had dozed off with his headphones on, so he slept through all the shouting. This was fine with Jeff. It was easier that Louis had not heard all of that. Jeff sat down on his brother's bed and nudged him slightly. It took a moment, but Louis finally opened his eyes and looked up. Jeff removed the earphones for him. You're free now, Louis. He's Jeff spoken ever so softly. Jeff? But what are you talking about? 
Louis mumbled, half asleep. You'll see in the morning. I just wanted to let you know I loved you. And you've been my best friend. You remember that. You remember that, okay? Uh, thank you. Uh, I love you too, Jeff. Now, let me go back to sleep, Louis replied, already dozing off again. Jeff smiled and stood up. As he left the door, he looked back at his sleeping brother one last time before vanishing into the night.